We're going to look at basic sources of information. We are going to talk about how information is organized, how to select a topic, and the different layers of research. Organization here at the GHC library. We are a lot of these principles you will be able to apply to other libraries and we will talk about what other library systems might use so you're familiar with those things but um, we are going to also focus on how GHC is organized since that's where we are and who we are and what we're learning about. Alright, how are we organized at Grace Harbor College? How, When you walk into the library you see all kinds of shelves of books, how are those organized? Those books are organized using the Dewey Decimal Classification System. This was created in, oh, say around the 1870s. These are organized by subject disciplines. So all the books about psychology are grouped together, all the books about business are grouped together, etc. Now it didn't used to be this way. It's, it's, that seems very obvious to us now because of course that's how we do things. But back in the, say, 1800s and prior to that, books weren't organized in that way. Basically the first book that was purchased is book number one and that was put on the shelf. Next to that was book number two, book number three, etc. They just had numbers on them, plain and simple, or some sort of system like that. Uh, possibly alphabetical, whatever the system they were using. And it didn't really matter that book number one was on gardening and book number two was on business and book number three was on uh, medicine. It didn't really matter that everything was different like that because the people themselves never got to go and browse the shelves. You would go up to a desk, you would ask for what you want, someone would maybe vanish into a back room where you never got to see, and they would come back with your, your item. So it didn't really matter that the books weren't grouped by subject. But there came a time where a guy came along. His name was Melville Dewey. He was a real mover and shaker in the library world back in the 1870s. And he thought, well, you know, if we actually organize the books in a way that made sense, in a way that um, people could find them and, you know, put them all together, then people would be able to find their own. <laughs> they would be able to find their own books. So that's why he came up with the classification system um, using the different subjects. So, for example, um, everything in the with a call number of 150 whether it be 151 152 153 etc everything from 150 to 160 is about psychology of some sort they all might be different like 151 might be abnormal psychology and 152 might be um, parapsychology etc etc but they're all some type of psychology he's the one who came up with that idea and, and that was great. It really revolutionized the way libraries were organized and how people got to information. It made it a lot easier. People were able to browse the shelves and see what they were looking for. Now, once that kind of t took hold and became more popular, another system came along, and that would be the Library of Congress, our National Library. They came along and they said, oh, well, now that you've got that figured out, we're going to improve upon it. So they waited until he had sort of sorted that out. And they came along and they started with the letters of the alphabet. So, for example, um, the letters, A, B, C. So a call number in Dewey Decimal classification might be something like 153.A4762. Uh, that same book in the Library of Congress classification might be something like H R thirty six forty seven point A Z twelve F seven. It might have it's got it's more of a number letter kind of thing. So they start with they started them automatically with twenty six categories. So there's a little more refinement in the Library of Congress classification system. Uh, most universities use Library of Congress. Uh, it is a little bit more, as I said, refined when you're dealing with larger numbers of books. So if you've got a, a library that's five or ten million volumes, it's, it's um, a little bit better structure to have Library of Congress. Most universities use Library of Congress classification. So if you're looking at the University of Washington library catalog online, for example, you're probably going to see call numbers that look completely different than the ones we use here. The idea is the same. Things on the same topic are grouped together.
So that's pretty, you know, that's pretty simple. The idea is there. Things that are on one topic are grouped together. But the call numbers will look a little different. Here, um, from where we are, the closest uh, Evergreen uses Library of Congress, uh, St. Martin's, things like that. So we don't use it here, but you will uh, probably see it if you transfer to another school. So that's how traditionally libraries organize information. We came up with a system of numbers that apply to different top subjects, and you classify that way. That's how we're organized. Other things that we organize at GHC, we have some special collections. Uh, we're still using the Dewey Decimal Classification, still using that, but in our special collections we have reference. So reference materials are separated out of the regular materials, but still using the Dewey Decimal numbers. So if you're in the main collection, you're going to go to the 150s for psychology. If you're in the reference collection, you're still going to go to the 150s for psychology, but you'll be getting reference books like encyclopedias and dictionaries, things like that. Our media collection, that's a special collection in our library, so that's all of our videos, DVDs, CDs, things like that. Those are going to be grouped together, still organized again by Dewey Decimal, but those are grouped separately. Our ESL materials are organized by topic as well, um, and those are in a separate area in our ESL area and our magazines are separated out. That's a special collection that we have uh, separated out from the books. They're not mixed in but they are also organized by classification. So you'll still find those in the same way if you're looking for psychology journals you'll still go to the 150 section. So, so those are some of the special collections that we have in our library. Once you are, so you kind of get familiar with how, what kind of topic, or what kind of disciplines we've got, how the library's organized. Um, you can look at your Dewey Decimal handout and see what the different call numbers mean. But once you, you kind of have an idea about that, you're going to look for how to select a topic. So, selecting a topic for research. Sometimes you're given a, a list of choices, sometimes you're just told pick anything you want, sometimes you might be um, given some guidelines, but not a lot. There's lots of different ways to go about it. So selecting a topic for research, what do you do? First, you need to think. Uh, always think. Think, take notes. <laughs> That's what you're going to hear. So what you want to think about when you're thinking about how to select a topic, you want to think about the requirements of the assignment. What is required of you? This this isn't fun. This is the These are the rules. This is the stuff that doesn't really isn't very interesting, but what are the requirements of the assignment? You don't want to spend a lot of time working on um, a paper or a project and then turning it in and realize that you missed something important. Oh, I didn't follow the instructions. That's going to be a problem. Length of the assignment, type of the assignment, and due date. So length. How long does your paper have to be? That can impact what topic you choose. Maybe you are going to cover you don't want to cover a really huge topic in just three pages or a really tiny topic in 20 pages. You have to kind of scale it. What type of paper is this? Is it argumentative, persuasive, um, informative? Are you doing a literature review? That's going to impact your topic a little bit too. So how, how are you going to, what kind of paper are you supposed to be writing? And then how soon is it due? How quickly do you have to have this information? You know, if you have to order things from other libraries, um, you know, you, do you, how soon do they need to be here, all of that. So you, you're probably going to have to gauge that a little bit by how fast you need your information. So those are things to think about when you're, when you're trying to pick a topic. What else do you need to think about? What are you interested in? That's a really good one to think about. Your interests. Because if you're not interested in a topic, what are you going to do? Probably ignore your homework <laughs> until the very last minute. People who are interested in a topic are going to hop right on it. They want to know this information. So sometimes that can mean you try and find a book on it and they're already checked out because the people who are really interested have already come in and checked them out. Uh, that kind of thing. So, But it's important. You, you want to be inspired. So what is interesting to you? Maybe you have prior knowledge of a subject. 
that is a really good way to um, find out about your interest. Maybe you had an experience with that. Personal experience, um, you or, your, or someone you know has an illness, you want to learn about it. Personal experience, you've read an article about it. You saw something in the newspaper. You know, oh, I read an article in the newspaper. It sounded kind of interesting. I'd like to know more. Maybe you saw a documentary. You were watching PBS and you caught something or the History Channel or whatever. You saw a little bit, sparked your interest. That's a good way to find out what are you interested in. These are things to consider. When selecting a topic, consider the availability of research materials. How, um, how much is out there? Uh, sometimes you don't find this out until you actually start. You start looking for your topic, start looking for your information, and then you discover, oh no, there's really not enough out here. You really have to be prepared to adjust your topic. Be prepared to, to make some changes to your subject once you get going. And like I said, you sometimes you don't find that out until you start. So that's why I recommend starting right away. If you wait till the last minute to start and then you find out that you're, there's not enough information and you need to change, sometimes you won't be able to. Some instructors don't let you change your topic partway into the quarter. So you really need to do at least some preliminary research right at the beginning. So think about what's available. Try to avoid subjects that may be too broad. Something that's huge. World War II. You could write volumes about that. That's a little bit huge. You're going to need to narrow it down. On the flip side, don't try and pick something too narrow. You don't want to have one specific thing that you're looking for. It's going to be too focused. Too recent. Something you're interested in can be great, but if it just happened, there may not be enough materials about there. A couple of newspaper articles about um, uh, what was it recently? Hurricane Irene. Uh, you know, a couple of newspaper articles about that. That's not going to be enough to to write a whole paper on. So something that just happened, there may not be enough information or too local. Again, it's kind of hard to balance between something you're interested in, which could very well be a local interest story, but. If it's just a local story and it's, again, there's three Daily World articles, how's that going to translate into a five-page paper? Probably not going to do it. So, you, But you can work with those. Something recent or something local, expand that to relate to what's happening here and relate that to state or national issues. Um, if, if you're looking at a local a local event or a local issue, you can, you can relate that. So you, you can... I don't say throw it out. If it's local, you can't use it. But if it's local, you probably need to combine it with some sort of a state or national. So you want to uh, adjust that. But those are things to think about, too, kind of gauging and scaling your topic. Then once you, you have an idea, you, you've, you think you've got a topic, you're going to start sort of narrowing it down or, or picking out the different facets, facets of the topic that you want to know about. So consider the following. Think about the different facets once you get your topic. I just said that. Consider the following about your topic. Time. Are you interested in a particular time period? Are you looking at Today, something, you know, current events, contemporary, modern research about this. Or are you looking at the 1800s? Is your topic applicable to then? I want to look at what happened in the Middle Ages. It was the 90s, um, you know, the 80s when the AIDS epidemic first started, um, you know, whatever you're looking for, you know, whatever time period. Is there a particular time period that you need to think about? The 1800s, the Middle Ages last year. I already said that. Place. A specific region or country. We're looking for a particular area. Europe, the United States, the Middle East, the South, cities, the country. Anything like that. 
Where are you narrowing it down? This can be important as you look through your resources, um, not necessarily as search words, although maybe, but more when you're reviewing your information to see where the focus is of that information. Um, for whatever reason, there seems to be a lot of nursing research and a lot of nursing trends that come out of New Zealand for some reason. And a lot of times I'll be helping people and they think that's what they want. And when we start kind of digging into the article and they're trying to find it, it's like, oh, well, you know, this is a, um, some research that was conducted in New Zealand. Is that really what you want? Maybe yes, maybe no, but you need to be aware of that. So think about, is there an area you want to focus on? Person or group. A known person or category of people. So that could be something like children, the elderly, teenagers, a person, Dr. Kevorkian, if you were doing something about assisted suicide, he would be a person to look into and who was instrumental in that, so that might be a good search keyword or thing to know about. It's important to know if there's somebody um, who was really uh, vital to your topic. And then some other aspect. Is there any other facet that you want to consider? Law. Law about something society's views of something, um, a treatment for something, ADD, I want to know what the treatment is, motivation behind this, um, you know, what makes somebody do something, what caused this to happen, what was the motivation. So there's lots of other aspects that you could be looking at. So research layers. Once we get uh, started, you kind of have some facets, you've made some notes, you have some ideas about a topic, you want to start in a little bit on your research. And there's different layers of research. Internet is at the top, periodicals, books, and reference materials. So your reference materials are going to be your foundation, or your starting point. These are going to be overviews, quick references, facts, data tables, um, a good place to start. You want to go through, start with your reference materials, find out an overview of your topic. Maybe you don't know a lot about it. Get some facts. Sometimes reference materials are good to come back to at the end. Once you've done a little more research in some of the other areas, come back around and get some more data on that or something to support something else you found. Like, oh, well, I found information that says this. Let me go back over to a reference book. These are going to be things like encyclopedias, almanacs, handbooks, dictionaries. And most people are familiar with encyclopedias and dictionaries. Most people have used those in school throughout the years. Uh, and th that's great. But when we're talking about reference materials, we're also really talking about specialized encyclopedias and specialized dictionaries. So for example, a medical dictionary, not just a general dictionary, but a medical dictionary, or an encyclopedia of social change. There are a lot of focus, uh, encyclopedia of sociology, um, encyclopedia of science and technology. So these are going to be more focused encyclopedias and dictionaries. You're not going to just go to World Book or something. These are going to, we're talking about more focused things. So these are great reference materials to get you going. After you find some reference materials, maybe get some pertinent information, pertinent information, uh, some good starting points. Then you're going to go up to books. These are going to be the foundation of your research. This is where you're going to start building. These are excellent for background and summary. Uh, even if a book is brand new, published this year, it still takes some time to get that information published. Just because it has the, you know, the most recent copyright doesn't mean it, it was just printed last week. So it takes a little bit of you know, time to do the research, to compile all that, get it edited, etc., 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 and get it into print and get it out there. So these are great um, to give you, at the time they were published, the most recent information, but also um, usually a book is going to have a lot of 
background on a topic. They have a lot more room, you know, they have a lot more pages in a book to be able to tell you information, give you some more history of something, how things started, give you some summary of what other people have, other research has been done, etc. So this is a really good place to start culling through. And using a book for your research doesn't necessarily mean you found a book on your topic and you sat down and read it from cover to cover. A lot of times when you're doing research, you're going to find the chapter that's perfect for what you want, or a couple of chapters or some sections. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to read it from front to back. You could. If, if, if it all pertains to your topic, you certainly could end up doing that, but that's not necessarily how that's going to work. So don't be afraid to use a book thinking, wow, that's a lot of pages, I'm not going to read all that. You don't necessarily have to read all of it. So got some reference book materials, you got some books, then you're going to look for periodicals. That's your recent and updated research. Periodicals. Anything that's published periodically. So that would be magazines, journals, newspapers, all your regular publications. Even if it's only published three times a year, but it's on a regular schedule, that's a periodical. Um, so whether it's a daily newspaper or a weekly, like Time magazine, or a quarterly, like Psychological Reports, those are all periodicals. So that's going to be your updated research, because they come out quicker, they can publish articles much faster, so they're going to have the newer stuff. It's going to explore the current literature. What are people doing now? Uh, a lot of times somebody does some research, they are going to get that published in a, a journal, and then they're going to write a book about it. So you may see the same type of research sifting through the different types of, of layers of research. Maybe um, they got an article published and then they end up turning that into a book in a couple of years and then maybe someday if it's really important research it ends up in a reference book. So these things kind of filter through. And so this is, so periodicals are going to be your, your current literature, things that are getting, uh, c things that are happening at, in uh, the field now. And then way at the top of that, top level, is the internet. Now I know most people, when they start researching, they just hop right on Google and get going. That can have its uses, but it's really not necessarily always the best way to go. This is going to be, you want to use the internet for your cutting edge and new information. Stuff that's new, that's important to remember. Use this primarily for information that's not yet available in print sources. So if something's, uh, you're finding it on the internet, but it's three years old, well, I would <laughs> go look for an article about that. Three years, could be a book out there about it now. Uh, you really want to use internet sources for things that are, are really cutting edge, things that are just happening, that are recent. Um, and some of that has to do with um, authority, and we'll talk more about that when we're talking about evaluating sources. But when you when you, something new or some research is coming out and somebody just publishes it on the internet that's great but then you want to look for that reliability and if it's really valuable valid information it's going to get picked up or that person who maybe put it out there right away they're going to write an article about it and they're going to start publishing it in other ways with more detail so you want to use the internet mostly for kind of new stuff So where do we find all these sources? Reference items, books, periodicals, internet sources. Where are they all? Well, that's what this class is all about. This is what we're going to talk about. Reference items. We have them in the library. Uh, you can find them in the library catalog. You can browse the shelves. So you can come into the library, you can either look online in the library's catalog and find reference items, or you can come into the library and browse the shelves. Also, we have some reference materials um, online, and we'll talk about those a little bit coming up as well. But uh, you, we have some reference, uh, reference books that are available online, so you don't have to come into the library. Books. What books do this, does the GHC library own? You're going to find these in our library catalog. So that's where you're going to look for those. Periodicals. We're going to look in online indexes. 
Academic Search Premier, ProQuest, SIRS, Science Direct. These are the kinds of things we're going to look for. We're going to look for, look for periodicals in those online sources. You can also come into the library and browse our shelves, uh, but the primary way you're going to find those is looking in online indexes. And internet sources. We're going to talk about how to get those. Most people are, again, familiar with a lot of these things, but um, Google, Yahoo, MSN, Bing, uh, different search tools, these are the kinds of things. This is how you get to those internet sources. They're out there, but how do you find them? You need a search tool, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. So this is sort of a road map to how this um, quarter is going to go. There, this, that's a map to the rest of our quarter, and we're going to talk about that. And we're going to look at these different types of sources throughout the quarter, how to find them, how to use them, what they're good for, and hopefully you'll get enough skills and practice with the GHC resources that you can transfer those skills to other library systems as well.